We know that when we are talking about connective tissue, it has got different classifications. You can classify it as being connective tissue proper or specialized connective tissue. We can also say in just the specialized, we can include liquid connective tissue or fluid connective tissue. Of course, we also have embryonic connective tissue. Now, this bone connective tissue is one of those which are specialized. So bone we know is a hard tissue that consists of living cells and a mineralized matrix. Apart from just a living part, it also has a dead part, which is non-living. That is going to also talk about the matrix. So the strength and rigidity of the this matrix that has been mineralized enables the bone to support and protect other tissues and organs because it has been mineralized meaning that it is hard that is why it is able to support and protect other tissue and organs so basically there are four types of cells which are going to be present in bone the osteogenic cells now these are mesenchymal cells from where all other bone that cells are going to be able to come from there is also osteoblasts osteocytes and osteoclasts. Now we're going to see that osteogenic cells will form osteoblasts and osteocytes, but osteoclasts are actually coming from hematopoietic stem cells. The, ma the matrix of bone has organic and inorganic components. The organic components, now when you're talking about organic, it means that these are made up of carbon. So the organic components of the matrix includes collagen fibers, and different proteins like carbohydrate molecules. And these are going to make up one third of the dry weight of the bone. And then the majority of the matrix is inorganic. And that makes up also two thirds of the dry weight. And it's a mixture of calcium and phosphorus, also called or known as hydrozapatite. So the organic portion of the matrix impacts tensile strength. That is the one, the organic uh, portion that is responsible for the tensile strength. While the inorganic portion is the one which impacts compressional strength. We are unable to compress the bone because of the inorganic. So we need to take note that all bones except surfaces of joints of long bones are going to be covered by a dense irregular connective tissue which is known as the periosteum i think you should have heard about perichondrium pericardium so it is the same the outer layer of connective tissue now this one has got two is going to have two layers the periosteum just like the perichondrium the pericardium they have got two layers now we need to also take note that bone has a rich vascular supply. This is because blood vessels are going to be able to reach to bone. There is a portion of the bone where blood vessels are able to pass. Different from cartilage, which does not have blood supply. Bone is going to serve a lot of functions, including storage, protection, and also a lot of support. So for storage, you are going to see that minerals are going to be stored, triglycerides are going to be stored. Bone is also important for formation of blood cells, and that is called hemopoiesis or hematopoiesis. Now, how do we get to classify bone? Bone is going to be classified as either being compact or spongy. Actually, the compact bone is the majority, and that is going to make up 80%. If you get one bone, you are going to find that about 80% of that bone is going to be compact and then 20% is going to be spongy. We also have red bone marrow. Red bone marrow is highly vascular, meaning it has got a lot of blood vessels and it contains hematopoietic stem cells. So it is in the bone marrow we are going to find these cells which are going to make all blood cells. Red bone marrow is very important in maintaining the health immune system. Be why is it like that? Because the bone, the red bone marrow specifically, forms all types of blood cells, including the white blood cells, which are involved in the immune system. 
So in children, a significant portion of their bone contains red bone marrow. As we get to grow, red bone marrow is going to decrease and, is, and it is going to more concentrate in certain bones, mostly long bones such as the pelvic bones, sternum, ribs, vertebrae bones, and the skull. And also at the ends of long bones like the femur and the humerus. And then you also have yellow bone marrow. Yellow bone marrow, this one consists of mostly fat cells and it is the main form of energy storage. It has got lower capacity of producing blood cells like the red bone marrow. So yellow bone marrow is going to accumulate in the central cavities of long bones of people as they get to grow and is going to be the one that is going to be replacing red bone marrow. What is its main function? It is a potential reserve of stem cells. Meaning that when there is need for bone to form, or let's say it, when there is need actually for blood cells to form, the yellow bone marrow can be converted to the red bone marrow and then there's going to be formation of blood cells. Now let's talk about the bone cells. Since we are saying bone is a connective tissue, it's supposed to have cells and the extracellular matrix. Extracellular matrix is supposed to be made up of the liquid component and the fiber component right so these are the cells we have got the osteocytes osteoblasts osteogenic cells which are the stem cells and then the osteoclasts what are the osteocytes osteocytes these ones are the cells which are going to be able to maintain bone so what is going to happen is that the osteogenic cells which are the stem cells are going to be converted or they are going to form osteoblast. I take the B for build. These are the ones which are going to form bone matrix. And then to maintain the bone that has been formed, you need the osteocytes which maintain that bone. If you want to break the bone, you need the osteoclast. I take the C in class to cut. Okay, It cuts bone. It is there for bone resorption. It's also important to take note where they are located. You can see the outermost part of the bone, this is what we call the periosteum. Now, the periosteum is going to be divided into two. There is an inner layer and an outer layer. So, it is the inner layer of the periosteum where we are going to find the osteogenic cells. And then, also, we are going to find the osteoblasts. Now, we can see the osteoclasts are a bit of inside is not actually found on the periosteum. And then the osteoclasts are very much inside. So it's important to take note of the location. So now let's just talk about each one of them. Osteoblasts, as we said, these are the ones which are going to synthesize the organic component in a process called ossification. So ossification is just adding of, of the matrix to form a strong bone. Osteoblasts are going to synthesize Type 1 collagen, proteoglycans, glycoprotein, these are the organic components. Deposition of the inorganic component of bone also depends on the presence of viable osteoblasts. The inorganic components we mentioned of calcium and also phosphorus. Osteoblasts are going to be found exclusively at the surface as we mentioned. And this is basically on the inner part of the perichondrium. It is going to have, this, the cells are going to resemble a simple epithelium, but when it is actively involved in making bone, the cells are going to resemble cuboid or columnar shape. And they are going to have a basophilic cytoplasm, meaning that they stain with basic dyes, then what color are they supposed to look? Mostly supposed to look blue because basophilic. Some osteoblasts are going to be surrounded by a matrix and immediately they get surrounded by a matrix. They are now called osteocytes. Now you've already formed the matrix. Now you need to maintain that matrix. It's now the osteocytes which maintain that matrix. So during this process, the osteocytes which are, which are now formed, they are going to be 
in what is called lacune, that is a space. So we have got the osteocyte surrounded by the matrix. In that space, we are calling lacuna or lacune. So lacune are occupied by osteocytes and their extensions along with small amount of extracellular non-calcified matrix. So I'm saying non-calcified because if it is calcified, it is now born, right? So matrix components are secreted at the cell surface, which is in contact with other bone matrix. As we saw on the bone, let me just go back here. The outermost part is the one which is going to excrete that matrix. That is what we are just saying. Matrix components are going to be secreted at the cell surface, which is in contact with the older bone matrix. This produces a layer of new, but not yet calcified matrix, which is called osteoid. So what is osteoid? It's simply a secreted matrix that is not yet calcified. Now, calcification is because of mineralization. You add minerals like calcium. So meaning osteoid does not have minerals. That's why it's not yet calcified. Even the word itself calcified just means addition of calcium. So this process, bone apposition, is completed by subsequent deposition of calcium into newly formed matrix. When you have formed the osteoid, you now get to add the calcium and then you have formed bone. Now we have got the osteocytes. Osteocytes are going to come, of course, from the osteoblast after osteoid matrix formation. When you form the osteoid, they are going to be found in spaces or cavities known as lacunae, which are found between matrix layers which are known as lamellae. Their cytoplasmic processes is going to extend into small canaliculi between the lamellae. We're going to see how they are, right? So only, it's important to take note that only one osteocyte is going to be found in each lacuna, in each space. Let me see if I have got a diagram. Okay, we're well, good. We are going to find it as we get to go on. So we need to take note of osteocytes being found in lacune and lacune being located between lamellae. These lamellae, of course, are just the osteocytes themselves. They are going to have processes. Their processes are going to extend into what is called canaliculi which is just a canal, which is going to be used for communication, right? Now we have got osteoblasts, sorry, osteoclasts, since we've already talked about osteoblasts. Osteoclasts are very large and they are multinucleated, a lot of nuclei. These are branched and they are motile cells found along bone surfaces where resorption, resorption is just breaking bones, remodeling and repairing of bone is happening. So dilated portions of the cell body is going to contain about five to 50 nuclei. So they are mouth nucleated and they are large. When an osteocyte, which is found in lacune dies, the matrix which surrounded this osteocyte is going to be re absorbed or resorbed by the osteoclast. So bone resorption is a natural process where osteoclasts are going to break down bone tissue, releasing minerals such as calcium into the blood stream. So if the function of osteoclast is, get, is to resorb bone. What happens here? You are breaking bone and when you break it, you are going to release calcium. This calcium is going to be released into blood circulation. So think of it, if there is hypocalcemia, meaning we have got low calcium, what is going to happen is that the osteoclasts are going to break bone and then release calcium into the blood to take it back to normal. So it was hypocalcemia is now going to be restored. Meaning if there is hypercalcemia, more calcium, their 
osteoclast will not do a very good job because they're supposed to not work. If they continue breaking bone, you are going to have more calcium and you are going to have even more hypercalcemia. So when there is more calcium in blood, it's actually the osteoblasts which are supposed to come in and make sure that they convert that calcium into bone or they store it into bone. All right. Osteocre uh, these osteoclasts, we need to know that they are derived from fusion of bone marrow derived from mononucleated cells. We need to take note that they do not belong to osteogenitor cells, just like the osteoblast and the osteocytes, uh, which come from osteogenic cells. These ones, they come from the hematopoietic progenitor cells called mononuclear macrophage monocytes. So in their active form, the surface of these osteoclasts is going to be facing bone matrix and is going to be folded into irregular, often subdivided projections, and those are going to form what is called a rough border. So surrounding the rough border is the cytoplasmic zone, which is called a clear zone. And that zone does not have any organelles, but it is a rich in actin filament. This is important to take note. So this zone is a site of adhesion of osteoclasts to the bone matrix and creates a microenvironment between the cell and the matrix in which bone resorption occurs. So the clear zone is where there is adhesion of this osteoclast to the bone matrix. So we can see here this is a bone. The outermost part here we can see is made up of osteoblasts right, osteoblast, and then you can see osteoclast, which is multinucleated here, and then as you get, so where this osteoclast means there is breaking of bone, when the osteoblast get to differentiate, they form osteoclast, which is found in lacunae there, and the osteoblasts, where are they coming from? They are coming from the mesenchymal cells, which are the osteogenic cells, and then the osteoclasts will continue forming. You, you see you've got bone matrix and then they'll get to synthesize osteoid, right? Osteoid there, which is at the end. So basically this is also at the end of the bone. What you are having, not really osteocyte synthesizing bone, is actually the same osteoblast, which is synthesized in the osteoid, right? This is what you are talking about as being the rough border or so the raffled border that's what we are talking about which you are able to see here the portion where the raffled border is there are no organelles and that is the point of attachment of the osteoclast to the bone you can see this is the osteoclast this one and then this is the bone matrix Another important thing to take note is that in areas of bone undergoing resorption, where you find the osteoclasts, osteoclasts are going to lie on the resorbed surface or within enzymatically corroded shallow depressions in the bone matrix, which are known as Horship's lacunae. So Horship's lacunae is where we're going to find the osteoclasts. These are just depressions, right? Osteoclasts, because they break down bone, they secrete collagenase. Collagenase is an enzyme that is going to, of course, work on collagen. You know, collagen is a fiber that forms these bones or dense, regular, dense, regular connective tissue. And that is going to promote the digestion of collagen and that is going to dissolve calcium salt crystals. Osteoclast activities, this is important to note, is that they are going to be controlled by cytokines and hormones what is going to happen is these osteoclasts these ones which break bone have got receptors for calcitonin calcitonin is produced by the thyroid gland it is a thyroid hormone it comes from the thyroid gland osteoclasts do not have receptors for pth which is the parathyroid hormone and there is a reason for mentioning this that is because osteoclasts have got receptors for calcitonin, while osteoblasts have got receptors for parathyroid hormone. 
Now, what do these do? Why are we even mentioning that they have got receptors for this and not for that? So these osteoblasts have got receptors for the parathyroid hormone. It is produced from the parathyroid gland. And when this hormone is activated, the parathyroid hormone is activated. Remember, osteoblasts have got a receptor for parathyroid hormone. So think of it as, let me just try to draw that. Think of it as this being, let's say this is, osteoblast let me put ob this is osteoblast and then it has got a receptor here this is a receptor for what this is a receptor for the parathyroid hormone parathyroid hormone so when the parathyroid hormone is going to attach here then it is activated and when the parathyroid hormone is activated it is now going to produce a cytokine, and that cytokine is known as osteoclast stimulating factor. So PTH has produced this hormone, I mean this cytokine, which is osteocyte stimulating factor. What is the osteoclast stimulating factor going to do? So the osteocyte stimulating factor is going to stimulate osteoclasts. What is the function of the osteoclast? So this one stimulates osteoclast. What is the function of the osteoclast? These have got a function of breaking bone. So they are going to break bone. And what happens if bone is broken? Calcium is released. When this calcium is released, it's going to go into blood. So it means if I add low, concentration of calcium in blood calcium is not going to increase in concentration so mostly if there is hypocalcemia then the osteoblasts are going to attach to the parathyroid hormone the parathyroid gland is going to produce the parathyroid hormone if there is what hypocalcemia we need to take note of that now, the osteoclasts also, they have got a receptor. Now, this receptor is for calcitonin. What does calcitonin do? If calcitonin attaches to the osteoclast, it is an inhibitor. It means the function of osteoclast will not be able to happen, meaning we will no longer have these osteoclasts getting to break the bone meaning we are going to maintain bone, right? So that is important to know, meaning the function of the parathyroid hormone is actually not direct, right? It's not a direct function. It acts in such a way that it's going to activate osteoclast. But the calcitonin in which direct attaches on the, on the osteoclast does the opposite. It will deactivate the osteoclast. So that is important for us to take note. So this is what we are mentioning. PTH comes from the parathyroid gland. is going to act in bone to raise blood calcium, as we have already explained. PTH effect, effect on osteoclast is indirect. That is because PTH have got receptors for... PTH receptors are found on the osteoblasts not on the osteoclasts themselves. That is why we are saying it is indirect. These receptors are going to be found on the what? Osteoblasts. When the PTH attaches to the osteoblasts, they are going to release now osteocyte stimulating factor. And that will stimulate now the osteoclast. The osteoclast now gets to be involved in bone resorption. Right. And then calcitonin now, is going to be, of course, it comes from the thyroid gland. It's going to reduce elevated blood calcium. If you have got too much calcium in blood, it's going to reduce that. How does it do that? It opposes the effect of PTH hormone in bone. We know that PTH is going to increase calcium. So what will happen is that calcitonin is going to reduce calcium. So if someone is suffering from hypercalcemia, you have got too much calcium, calcitonin is going to be produced so that 
you have got the PTH being limited so that it does not activate the osteoclast which will make more calcium to be formed. So I think I've taken time on that one and it is important for us to understand it. Okay, so this is what I'm just from mentioning. PTH is going to be secreted when you have got low calcium so that you increase the calcium. And then calcitonin is going to be produced when you have got high levels of calcium. Right. Now we've already talked about the bone matrix. So bone matrix is going to have inorganic material. This is the inorganic material. And it's going to be made up of 50% of the dry weight of the matrix. So matrix itself is going to have inorganic and organic. So about 50% is going to be inorganic material. And the major component of the inorganic material that is going to make up this matrix is known as calcium hydrozapatite. So this is just a crystallized form of calcium. When calcium is in forms of crystals and it's the most abundant, please, we need to take note of this. It's not the only one. You also have bicarbonates, which are inorganic, citrate, magnesium, potassium, and sodium ions. All these are going to also be the inorganic components. So the organic matter itself now is going to be embedded in the calcified matrix. So we have got a matrix that has got calcium now just inside. So this is the matrix that has been calcified. Now inside where there is no calcification, that's where we are going to find the organic matter. And that one is made up of mainly type 1 collagen, proteoglycans, and, and these others like glycoproteins such as osteonectin. Osteonectin is a glycoprotein found in bone. Okay, we have also chondronectin. That one should be in cut, uh, connective tissue. Chondro has to do with cartilage, so that is in cartilage. Right. So calcium binding glycoproteins like osteocalcin and the phosphatases are going to be released in the matrix vesicles by osteoblasts. So this is important to take note. What releases phosphatases is osteoblast. And when these are released, this is going to promote calcification of the matrix. The matrix is now going to undergo calcification. All right. So calcium binding glycoproteins. So these are glycoproteins that are able to bind calcium. Glycoproteins are able to bind calcium. For example, osteocalcin, phosphatases, these are going to bind calcium. If they bind calcium, then there's going to be calcification getting to happen. So we need to take note of that. Right. So we have got other tissues which contain type 1 collagens, but they do not contain osteocalcin. So because of that, they are not going to be calcified. Even if they contain type 1 collagen, it's not going to be a hard bone you're not going to have bone which is hard because there is no osteocalcin which is there to make sure that it binds calcium and then calcification gets to happen okay because of its high collagen content decalcified bone is usually acidophilic a bone that is not calcified which does not have calcium has got a lot of collagen and collagen is a protein it is positively charged proteins anything that is positively charged that would mean it is basic so it is going to stain we see a dye that is acidic which is why we are saying they are acidophilic this is important to take note of collagen is acidophilic examples of acidic dyes can mention is eosin eosin okay so that is an example of course, collagen can be stained by Van Gison. It is a stain that we're able to use. So the association of minerals with collagen fibers during calcification is the one which is going to be responsible for the hardening or hardness and resistance of bone. When minerals and collagen fibers associate, that makes the bone hard. 
after bone is discalcified, meaning calcium has been removed, its shape can still be preserved, but it is more flexible like a tendon. Like you have removed the calcium, meaning it will not be hard, but the collagen is still there, so it is going to be flexible. For example, a tendon. Okay. So bone, we need to take note that it has got an outer layer and an inner layer. Outer layer is the periosteum, inner layer is layer is the endosteum. The outer layer, which is the periosteum, is going to have two layers. So what it is, you have got, think of it, you have got this and another layer. They are so much close to each other. Think of a plastic. If this is a plastic, and then I press it here with something that is sharp. So what you are going to see is that you are going to still have it like this and then it will go in like that and then it will come back. It will be that thin and then it will be like that. Okay. In that you will not even realize that there is a difference between these two layers, but they are different. Okay. So it is just one layer, but it's more like you have wrapped it on itself such that it forms one layer which is outside, one layer that is inside. So the outermost layer is fibrous. The innermost layer is osteogenic. This is important to take note. So the periosteum has got two layers, the inner layer and the outer layer. Let's say this is a bone. So this layer which is outside is going to be the outer and it is fibrous, made of the collagens. The inner portion of this same periosteum is going to contain osteogenic cells which form bone. They are going to form osteoblasts, which form now osteocytes, and then that forms our bone. Okay. So again, outer layer is dense connective tissue with a small blood vessels, collagen bundles, and fibroblasts. Fibroblasts, these are simply cells of connective tissue. Bundles of periosteal collagen fibers called perforating fibers of Chape are going to penetrate bone matrix, binding the periosteum to bone. So the periosteum, this is the periosteum. You are going to have some bundles of collagen fibers, more like going inside like this. Okay, going inside like that. Those are now called perforating fibers of Chape. These are going to penetrate bone matrix. The matrix is here. Are going to penetrate bone matrix and that will be responsible for holding the outermost layer of the bone to the bone itself. The inner region of the periosteum, as we said, is cellular. It contains osteoprogenitor cells. With the potential to proliferate, these osteogenic cells have got the potential to proliferate and differentiate into osteoblasts. So these osteoprogenitor cells are very much important in the growth of bone and in the repair of bone. So that is what they do. What is the function of the outermost cell, which is the periosteum? It is there to, nu to nourish the osseous tissue or the bone tissue. And it is going to be there to provide continuous supply of new osteoblasts for appositional bone growth. Apposition growth is one of the types of growth that is going to be involved to make sure that bone grows in with it like that. Okay, so we are there to these oh, periosteum are there to supply a new osteoblast. Remember, it's where the osteoprogenitor cells are found, and the osteoblasts are going to be involved in growth. So this is what we're able to see. This is periosteum. It's going to have an inner layer and an outer layer. We can see we have got outer layer, which is fibrous, and then the inner part, which is cellular. We also have the endosteum. So that was just the periosteum, which was the outermost layer of the bone. We also have the endosteum. Now, the, this is the endosteum. Endosteum is going to be able to align. We can see. Ondosteum has got these cells, 
We also have osteoclast here. You have got the bone matrix. So endosome is now the one which is going to line the bone matrix, so the inner part of the bone. The peristome is going to line the entire bone, the outer part of the bone. Endosium will line the inner part of the bone, the bone matrix. Okay. You can see we also have osteocytes on the middle in spaces known as lacunae. Osteogenic cells are supposed to be at the end, at the end, right? So this is it. So we have got two types of bones, as we mentioned earlier, the compact bone and also the cancerous bone. Compact bone is also known as cortical bone, and it makes up 80% of total bone. The basic unit of a compact bone is known as an osteon or Havesian system. I need us to take note that osteon is also known as Havesian system, not Havesian canal, Havesian system. Each osteon has got four many parts, lamellae, lacunae, canaliculi, and Havesian canal, which is also known as the central canal. What is lamellae? These are simply rings, concentric rings of extracellular matrix that is going to consist of minerals, calcium and phosphates. Okay, the phosphates. The lamellae are going to be responsible for compact nature of the type of bone. Compact meaning, why is this compact bone really that compact? Why is it strong? It's because of the lamellae, the rings. Lacuna is a small space just between the lamellae and that contains osteocytes. Canalicula is a network of minute or small canals that project from the lacunae, just from the spaces, and that will contain processes of osteocytes. So the canalicula is going to provide root for nutrients to reach osteocytes and for ways to leave them. And the central canal contains blood vessels and nerves. Okay. So the osteon, we need to know that it runs in parallel to the shaft. So if this is a bone, this is the shaft of the bone or the diaphysis, it's going to run parallel like that. Let's see how it looks like. So this is the structure. If you get this is our bone here, and then you just try to cut a certain portion, you are going to see it like this. So the outermost layer here, we call it as the Peristium, which has got outer fibrous layer, okay, and an inner osteogenic layer, All right? And then you can see we have got a lot of osteons. Just this one alone is an osteon, an osteon, an osteon. All those are osteons. Now, the osteon is also known as the Avesian system. So, the entire of this is known as the Avesian system. We can see on the middle, we have got blood vessel. That is called the central canal or the Avesian canal, where we're going to find those blood vessels. And then we have got these rings around. We have got these things around, rings, concentric rings around. That is what we are calling as the lamellae. Okay, as the lamellae rings around. Now just between the lamellae we can find spaces. These spaces, these are what we are calling as lacunae. The lacunae inside they contain what? They contain only one. Each lacunae will contain one osteocyte. One osteocyte. And the osteocyte inside the lacunae is going to have projections. These projections and those are what we are going to refer to as canaliculi. These are the ones which are responsible for conne communication, connection, and for transfer and removal of waste products, and also the taking in of nutrients to the osteocyte inside the lacuna. So that is important for us to take note of that. We can see we have got outer circum. Uh, the circumferential lamellae, these are the lamellae which are here. The outermost ones, you can see these ones are not rounding an osteon. And then we have got concentric lamellae, which is a rounding an osteon. Now, lamellae is not, it's not these lines we are seeing. It's actually all this, the all of this ring, this bundle we can see here.